Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the concept of quantum entanglement. With me is my dear old friend, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher a theoretical physicist and author of several books, including Orbiting the Moons of Pluto, Complex Solutions to the Einstein, Maxwell, Schrodinger, and Dirac Equations, and also The Holographic Anthropic Multiverse. In addition, Elizabeth was one of the main personalities studied in the landmark book by MIT professor David Kaiser called how the hippies saved physics, science, counterculture, and the quantum revival. And furthermore, she's authored more than 250 scientific papers, has been on the faculty of the University of California, John F. Kennedy University, the University of Nevada. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You and I go back a long time, about close to four decades. I know. It's mm -hmm. amazing how time flies. Yeah. Yeah, but we need to understand the nature of time. Mm -hmm. but, it, <laughs> but it does fly. Yeah. It's been a fantastic adventure. It has indeed. Now, the concept of quantum entanglement is very much on people's minds, I think, these days. But back when you first formed the Fundamental Physics Group at the University of California, people weren't too interested in understanding w w the meaning of such a term. Well, it had just come about that in 71, John Clauser had done the initial experiments to demonstrate this phenomena. And I'll give you a little background. Mm -hmm. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wrote a paper in 1935. And what Einstein's idea was, he wanted to say, quantum mechanics is not complete. Therefore, I can measure some system that should be quantum but isn't. But if quantum mechanics is complete, there's something called non-locality, or what was called spooky action at a distance. Woo woo. Mm -hmm. But what it really is, is that particles that are born together, and I'll explain that in more detail, stay in connection with each other over even kilometers of distance. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a second revolution to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's libraries full of books about what that means, and there's going to be libraries of books about what quantum entanglement means. And of course, there's all kinds of philosophical spin-offs, because if I do something here, and it affects a remote location over here, that's pretty darn interesting, mm -hmm. because there is an all interconnectedness that seems to be in the web of the quantum uh, reality. Now, Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky, when they first came up with this paradox, their notion was to, to show that quantum physics couldn't really be correct because uh, this spooky action at a distance to them was a logical impossibility. Absolutely. They were, uh, the formalism was to disprove or to show a way that you could disprove the completeness of quantum theory. Mm -hmm. Then in 1964, John S. Bell, as called Bell's theorem, uh, came up with a formalism that was very discreet of how you could apply the EPR paradox and do an experiment. EPR meaning Einstein, uh, Rosen, Podolsky, and, Podolsky Rosen. and Rosen. Yeah. Right. So and he formalized their thought experiment. Right. They, mm -hmm. uh, their uh, Duncan experiment. So in 1971, I was fortunate to meet John Clauser. And in the basement, he had this big experiment. And um, the budget wasn't that great, so there was some kind of, you know, black duct tape mm -hmm. holding it together. But there's other replications I'll talk about. But what it is, is if I have an atomic decay, where I have an excited atom like a calcium atom, and it gives off two photons that are almost simultaneously, 
the photons go up. Well, s photons have spin one. Mm -hmm. So if I measure a polarizer here that measures spin one up, then this one will be measured spin one down. That correlation holds, and that's what uh, Bell formulated. Now, I measure their existence of the photons with a photomultiplier. But this was over meter distances. Mm -hmm. Then Alan Aspey at Orsay in France did it over kilometers of distance mm -hmm. with a very fancy piece of equipment in which after the photons left, he made this decision, spin up here and then spin down mm -hmm. here. Giesen and group in Italy replicated over kilometers of distance. There's a recent Chinese experiment. And the question is, is if these go out at the speed of light, and nothing can go faster than the speed of light according to relativity, yet it looks instantaneously. I tweak the universe here, and I find the universe over here is responding to, mm -hmm. to that tweakiness. Faster than the speed of light. Yeah, it may be instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the discussions we had in the fundamental physics group. This is the group that you set up uh, at Berkeley when you were still a student that uh, was one of the main focuses of that book, How the Hippies Saved Physics. Right, and what, how that came about is in my sophomore, no, my junior level quantum mechanics course, mm -hmm. I asked what is the meaning <laughs> of a quantum measurement? In yeah. other words, how do I take a symbol, a wave function, and attach it to a concept of, say, electron? Mm -hmm. What's that correlation? And what does this mean? Including the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where momentum and uh, distance cannot be completely accurately measured. Mm -hmm. And there's an uncertainty in the reality, which uh, Einstein didn't like. Mm -hmm. He wanted a deterministic worldview. So I asked what the meaning was, and of course I was told to shut up and calculate, and I said no. I'm studying this for a reason. I want to know what's going on. Yeah. I want to understand the purpose and meaning because really everything we deal with in life has a motivation. And when I asked physicists what their motive was to do an experiment, say, they said, oh, I have no motive. Of course you have a motive. You have a desire. You may just love to do experiments. You may want to get a grant. You may want to get a PhD. You know, there's always a purpose behind it. Well, you're bringing consciousness into uh, our discussion when you talk about purpose and, and motive. But physics itself, it, it wasn't always like this in the early 1970s, that mantra, shut up and calculate. Was the dominant view. And it was not the case, let's say, in the 1930s when oh, the great that was physicists were formulating quantum theory before the atomic bomb. Huh? Well, before the atomic bomb, what happened was there was an open discourse, and the discourse got quite lively <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, between the various people. And of course, most of the physicists could be in one room, like the Solvay conferences. And it was over issues of what does a quantum measurement really mean? What am I measuring in the microscopic world that I'm making an image of? Now, electrons aren't little steely balls, or photons aren't little fuzzy characters, but we have an image in our mind, but we're making a mathematical symbol to represent those properties and what those actions are. And it was questioned. You know, like the Schrodinger cat paradox, if I have a wave function with two terms, cat dead and alive, before I measure, but the cat may know whether it's alive. <laughs> but the point was there were questions, and then World War II came, and even Ed Teller, who suggested classifying everything to do with the bomb, said it might take a niche out of education in physics and actually destroy modern physics. And it did, because then the questioning was 
verboten yeah. and off the list. I know. I took a, an undergraduate course in physics in the 1960s, and I'm a person who has a high mathematical aptitude, but I was completely turned off. It wasn't until I came to Berkeley and met people like yourself and Jack Sarfati and Saul Paul Sarag, all the heroes of the book, uh, How the Hippies Save Physics, that I began to develop my own interest and uh, have subsequently done many TV shows. But the way physics was taught in that era, for me, was, was a major turnoff. Well, actually, I loved physics mm -hmm. until <laughs> when I was at Berkeley, uh, 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 Louis Alvarez w t uh, for three weeks talked about, oh my God, time machines, time travel, general relativity. Oh, I thought, my God, I'm in seven heaven. Then after three weeks, he said, a third of you dropped out, and now it's pulleys and ladders. Mm -hmm. Now, pulleys and ladders are useful, but they're boring. <laughs> and I ended up teaching mechanics, but the course was in mechanics. And it was very, um, you know, it's kind of fun playing with the equations, but it really wasn't what I was interested in. That was really the philosophy or conceptual framework behind physics. It was it was boring mm -hmm. until we got to some juicy stuff. Of course, at Berkeley, you're at you know one of the world's great capitals in the world of, of physics, with maybe a dozen Nobel laureates on the faculty. Well, uh, they they were <laughs> laureates out the yin yang. Yeah. I think I met about eight Nobel Prize winners, mm -hmm. and I had three on my PhD committee. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what happened was, in about the early 70s, I thought, uh, you know, what I wanted to do was study physics and consciousness. I always wanted to know what thoughts were, like thoughts are real and have real consequences, I think. And so I wanted to study consciousness, but I figured I'd start from what was known the most, mm -hmm. which was the physical domain, yes. and work on there up from there, which would take me 10,000 years, or a bunch of reincarnations, or, but you know, gotta get started somewhere, you know. So I, I got started, and then I thought, well, let's do physics scribe committee, just like in the 30s. Let's revive the Solvay conferences. And so I got together with George Weissman, and then I had met Frischoff Kapper, the head of the physics theory group. Jeff Chu handed me a paper, and he said, this is your stuff. And it was one of Frischoff's early chapters in his Tao of Physics. And so that interested me, because I always been interested in Eastern religion since I was about nine. And so that intrigued me, and then I met Sol Paul Sarag, Nick Herbert, Fred Allen Wolf, Jack Sarfati, and then there was a guy at the lab, Philippe Eberhardt, mm -hmm. Jeff Chu, Henry Stapp, mm -hmm. and then I, you can set up a committee and uh, reserve a room, then get the AVs or audio visuals, and so that's what I did, and I set it up on E.O. Lawrence's old office, and he was the one that built the accelerators, the mm -hmm. circular accelerators, and now that the CERN. Of course, the first yeah. one was about this big. The cyclotron. The cyclotron, about yeah. that big. Mm -hmm. And uh, they grew like mad. But anyway, the idea, of course, is to accelerate particles, smash them into a target, and see what you create. So um, that whole thing came together, and it just was a fortuitous. You came, Be uh, Beverly Rubick came. Yes. We started with about six, and we ended up with 40 people attending these weekly meetings for three years. And these are people who were interested in deep philosophical questions about what, what does uh, it mean to have uh, these various paradoxes, which according to Clauser's experiments were being proven true. Einstein thought that spooky action at a distance was an impossibility and he could disprove quantum theory and just the opposite occurred. Spooky action Absolutely. at a distance. Absolutely. He was background to, to spooky action at a distance. Historically, when Newton came up with gravity mm -hmm. and the um, uh, Earth's going around the sun with the Copernican view, of course, the church at that time said that's spooky action at a distance. It's gravity. like drawing, yeah, gravity, like mm -hmm. drawing a vector from an archangel to God. Right. So there's always been this anti-spooky at an action at a distance idea. Mm -hmm. 
But if you really think about, I mean, many religions, Eastern philosophies and religions, are about our interconnectedness and our unity and our whole. Yeah. And so, although quantum mechanics doesn't prove we're all one in consciousness, it's an arrow pointer, it's an indicator. Mm -hmm. And you really cannot do something over here in the universe and not affect over here. Now, a butterfly probably doesn't flap its wings and cause a hurricane, but it is a nonlinear universe, it's an interconnected universe, and I personally believe there's a unity of oneness in consciousness and also mirrored in the physical world as proved by these entanglement experiments. Mm -hmm. well, and at the same time, it's fair to say in the 1970s at Berkeley when all of this uh, excitement was going on in physics, there was quite a lot of parapsychological research. Well, the fundamental physics group, I had uh, five different things that I was going to study. One was the Clauser experiment. One was the replication of the remote viewing work of Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, Ingo Swan, and Pat Price at SRI International. One was on multidimensional geometries and general relativity. And then, uh, of course, the foundations and interpretations of the nature of consciousness. Now, what we really did is we focused mostly on the spooky action at a distance or, or the entanglement issue. Uh, but we also did multidimensional geometries and how that implied at a macroscopic scale non-locality mm -hmm. and entanglement. And then we did replicate the remote viewing work with that fundamental physics group and a Berkeley research group that I set mm -hmm. up with. Now, you used a new term, non-locality which I guess is somewhat synonymous with the notion of quantum entanglement, but let's if, define if it. If I tweak the universe here with this polarizer, then this is a non-local effect to find this spin up, and that means that this spin is down. Mm -hmm. So because nothing goes faster than the velocity of light according to Einstein, each photon only goes at the velocity of light, so really, it is spooky action at a distance. I wouldn't call it that. It's just the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. But it is non-local. Non-local non meaning that uh, if it were a signal going back and forth, it, it's outside of the light cone, if right. meaning it, faster than the speed right, of light. Right, because the, the, the light cone, space-time Minkowski space, mm -hmm. and like you can't get a pizza without saying when and where you're going to meet for pizza. So you specify space and time. Mm -hmm. So time is a fourth dimension of space is a very fundamental concept in special and general relativity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, wh what you're looking at is how things occur in space-time. Mm -hmm. So if I have a normal four-dimensional space-time, I can't really explain this. But right. I can with a complex eight-dimensional space which I developed. Okay. You can explain non-locality. And the other thing that's happened with entanglement is the qu uh, current quantum computer um, frenzy uh, phase, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what to call it, but the thing is, with this quantum entanglement, if I have this non-local communication, can I construct an informational system? Nick Herbert worked on that, and others have worked on it, and this, it's still wonderfully controversial. That's what's, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the frontiers of physics today. Right. Is, is can we build computers based on quantum mechanical principles? Right, mm -hmm. right. Because if I want my digits of uh, zeros and ones that have spin up and spin down would be one way of saying that I have that. But I also have an addition to the mechanical, or actually, of course, electronic computers of just specifying ones and zeros I will have a linkage between this zero and this one, say, mm -hmm. or spin up and spin down, which makes a whole dimension, a whole other dimension of what a co quantum computer presumably does. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, as, as we speak, 
I understand nobody has yet built a quantum computer. That's what I understand. There's actually private groups in some universities working on it, and there was actually work kind of going back to um, the mid and late 80s, like um, uh, the Air Force was working on trying to build a quantum computer with organic materials. Mm -hmm. So there's been all kinds of different efforts. I don't know if that was still classified, mm -hmm. probably not. It was a public mm -hmm. meeting. But it's interesting because then what do you say about consciousness? Uh, can you build a conscious computer? Well, what I say is called the Turing uh, principle or the mm -hmm. Turing machine. Alan Turing Alan being Turing, one yeah. of the great inventors of the computer oh, back amazing. in the 1940s. Yes, and he decoded the uh, uh, Russian, a uh, uh, German Enigma device, mm -hmm. and that movie, if you see it, um, uh, on his life is yeah. fantastic mm -hmm. and very well done. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is, he was saying, I think I can build a computer that will fool you as to being conscious. Well, right. at the time it was at SRI International, there was a computer program on the DARPA net. Because mm -hmm. the DARPA net sort of led to the, uh, uh, the internet. internet. Yes, yeah, indeed. so yeah. that was the origin of the mm -hmm. internet. Yep. And and actually in those days... You could it, have a conversation with... You have a conversation with someone in New York and it's all on a teletype, right. clicky keys going yep. on. but. Yeah, uh, uh, in the, that they had a, a, a game, a computer game. Eliza, she, is that? Eliza, and yes. you ask Eliza questions mm -hmm. like, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. and Eliza says, fine, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. the answers are actually, you know, you could ask about five to ten questions, mm -hmm. and you could probably say it was not a very verbal person, yeah. but Eliza, you could probably fool a person. Many people were because, as I understand it, Eliza was based on a principle of psychotherapy developed by Carl Rogers, client-centered yes. therapy, where you, you sort of turn the question around and ask it again. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. And that's, well, if, if you ask Eliza, how are you? Then Eliza says, well, how are you doing? Well, yeah. how many people do that? Yeah. Almost everybody. Mm -hmm. So so we, we had fun with Eliza, but what my answer to that is, since psychic phenomena exist, mm -hmm. you're not going to probably build a psychic computer. Even with quantum entanglement, mm. even with that, I don't think you're going to uh, build all aspects of what consciousness really is. But if one could build a computer that could demonstrate ESP, you might agree it actually was conscious. I might agree that it could fool me. Yeah. I might agree that Turing could fool me if he could add if he could add uh, ESP to his computer, which I don't think he was going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's a very interesting question because it really gets to what I wanted to do was to bring physics and consciousness together and really look at the ph ph philosophical and also sociological foundations. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I am really pleased with the revolution and I feel John Clauser ex experiment was so important yeah. and that he should get a Nobel Prize. It's, it's, it's very profound. And, well, you were quite instrumental in uh, calling Clauser's work to the attention of the larger community. I was, yes, I really was. And I tell you, I remember the day going down in the basement, seeing his equipment, and when I grokked what was really going on, oh my God, I thought this is fundamental. Mm -hmm. extremely important and must be addressed. It's just a very fundamental issue. And actually, you know, Henry Stapp and other people I brought in mm -hmm. uh, really, you know, uh, got involved and so Paul uh, really did excellent work mm -hmm. in uh, dis uh, discussing uh, what he interpreted, the various interpretations of what uh, non-locality and quantum yes. entanglement mean. So and Paul so Sirog. Sirog mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and Nick Herbert mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I th uh, there was a paper in FizzRev called the Anti... Let's see, what was it? Um, 
something to anti telephone. It was <laughs> a takeoff on on non locality, but mm -hmm. published in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was f sort of facetious, but kind of landmark too. Mm -hmm. Well, what came out of this group of hippies, this oh, group yes. of characters was um, uh, maybe a dozen or more books, very serious books, looking at the relationship between quantum physics and consciousness. Oh, absolutely. Um, there's Gary Zukoff's book, The Dancing Wooly Masters, very good books by Nick Herbert. And uh, uh, Fred Allen Wolf uh, has uh, written some very a dozen books. A dozen books, and mm -hmm. the point was that it really was a quantum revolution. I'm not sure I'd call it a quantum revival, mm -hmm. but it did revive the '30s. So in that sense, I would agree with that, and it gave a new uh, excitement and impetus. And you know, I've heard physicists say. Uh, kind of before this uh, period, mm -hmm. oh, we almost know everything. And yeah. of course, that's a real, if you say that, you're in trouble. Very I know, it was trouble. said back in the 19th century. Right, uh, in uh, 1899, the yeah. head of the patent office said, almost everything's invented, we'll close the patent mm -hmm. office. And then about that so time, they all, uh, there was a statement that physics, almost everything's discovered and it's just one more decimal place. And then there was a revolution with the Rayleigh Jeans Law that led to H-bar and Planck's constant and quantum mechanics. And then the interpretation of the Michelson-Morley experiment and relativity. Mm -hmm. So whenever you think you know something, you're in trouble. Well, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, you remind us uh, much in the spirit of Monty Python, I suppose, that everything we think we know is probably wrong. Uh, and that's and for the best. something can change at any instant for the better. Uh, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.